Linda Deutsch. If you have read a newspaper in the last 45, 50 years about any major trial in the world, you have likely read her name, Linda Deutsch. Linda, welcome. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be here with you. Uh, it's an honor. Linda, I want to start, if I might, at the beginning. I want to start by inviting the audience to understand a little bit about your beginning. Writing was in my family. My uncle, who was probably the most influential figure in my life, uh, became a journalist. He was worked for the New York uh, Herald Tribune, and then he came to California because he met the love of his life who lived out here. And so he wanted to be with her in California. Uh, he made trips back occasionally, and he was the one that urged me to get into journalism. Prophecy is dubious business. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But had your uncle not been an encouraging force to you? Well, I, would I have been a journalist? Yes. Most likely I would have found my way, but not as quickly as I did. Because he came to visit while I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And so in my junior year of high school, I was already selling stories to the local paper. And I was writing for, they had a school page of the Asbury Park Press mm -hmm. every week. And I was basically writing the whole page. I got into journalism and I ran with it. I loved it. Yes, the power of mentorship. Right, and okay. mentorship wound up being a big thing in my life because not only my uncle, because he, he was the driving force, but he went back to California. Mm -hmm. I went to Monmouth and they did not have a journalism program. They had, I was an English major. I loved the word, the written word. I became editor of the Campus Literary Magazine, which was a prize winner. It was fabulous. And we would go out and we would interview famous authors. Mm. That was the beginning of my interviewing experience. Do um, you remember any that you interviewed? Oh, sure. We went and interviewed John Cheever wow. at his, his home up in Ossining, New York. We interviewed the, the, um, Pretty the good. poet Leroy Jones mm. in the Bowery in New York. Mm. Uh, we had some great interviews, and, mm -hmm. uh, and our, we won prizes every year for the magazine. So mm. that's where I was focusing because there was no journalism program. Right. But then there was one semester of journalism offered, mm -hmm. and of course I took the course. Well, the teacher said to me, you don't need this course, you've been doing all this already. I was already feature editor of the campus newspaper, and I was selling stories to the local paper. And he said, why don't you just work on class time? So that was terrific, but then he did something for me that was life altering. Which is? He got me a summer job with the paper in the town where I was born, Perth Amboy. Hmm. The Perth Amboy in, Evening in, in News. A, in a weekly newspaper? No, it was a, a major a daily. daily. Okay. I kind of lived a charmed life from the time I got into journalism. Um, while I was working at that paper, I, I was reading through the paper one day and I saw that there was going to be this civil rights march on Washington. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated. This is now 1963, right. August. Right. August 1963. Yeah. You become aware of this march on Washington, mm -hmm. a civil rights demonstration, highly controversial at the time. Yes, they were predicting violence. Uh, I knew plenty about the civil rights movement because I was editor of the Campus Literary Magazine. We'd written about it. And we, there were many activists in my class. There were kids that had gone freedom riding, all of that. I was working this night job. I didn't see the editor, but I left, I clipped out a piece of a clipping from the paper about the, s the march right. and left it on his desk at night when I left with a note saying, don't you think we should cover this? We, because I was 18 years old. I, was, mm -hmm. I, was, I had no standing to really demand right. anything. Right. And he called me at home the next morning. I'll never forget it. He said, so you want to cover this, huh? And I said, yeah, I'd really like to. And he said, well, okay, you can cover it but it can't cost us anything. That was my first lesson in journalistic economics. Okay, tell us about journalistic economics. And so I knew that I couldn't spend any money. So how are you going I, to get, I get there? From Perth Amboy, New Jersey, to Washington, to Washington DC. I called the NAACP chapter 
and told them I wanted to write a story and could I come with them on their bus. They were delighted to have me. And that's how I got there. I went with them on their bus. So the power of initiative, the power of creativity mm. and audacity again rears its head. But it was dangerous, and I could not tell my mother that I was going. Why? Because she would have worried desperately that I was going to be harmed. Uh, they were predicting riots. They were predicting all sorts of stuff. And I was then staying in Perth Amboy with my aunt, and she and I conspired basically not to tell my mother and for me to just go. But just talk for a minute of just how controversial race relations were mm -hmm. in America at that time. People were getting killed in the South. Um, the uh, Cheney and Schwerner and the three guys, the, the uh, civil rights workers who were murdered yes. were a huge story. Uh, there had been a lot of people murdered. Um, it was... Risky. It was risky, but I didn't think of that. When you're 18 years old, you don't think of that. Mm -hmm. um, and as it turned out... Well, you thought about it enough not to tell your mother. That's true. Okay. So but now as it turned out, it was one of the most peaceful demonstrations that ever happened in this country. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, as a, as a person, uh, looking at the civil rights movement, it was life-altering. I mean, I remember standing out there with my arms around people in the crowd, black and white, singing, We Shall Overcome. You couldn't help but join in. It was so affecting. Now, when you were there, you heard many speakers mm -hmm. you were covering. Was it evident to you that this young, charismatic preacher, not particularly well known at the time, mm -hmm. named Martin Luther King, was to be destined to be the, the leader that he became? Was that? It was, no, it was too chaotic for one thing. I did hear him give the speech, but mm. the famous I Have a Dream speech. Yes. But it was so late in the day. They, they held him until the last. Mm -hmm. And everybody was trying to get out of there and go home. Mm -hmm. So it was a wonder that we even listened to it, but we did. Mm -hmm. And I have in, I, I was able to track down my story from that day, which was, it was my first front page byline. In the Perth Amboy newspaper. Yeah, and it did mention the speech, and it said that um, one of the members of our group thought it was the greatest speech he had ever heard. Now, you have to realize that the Washington Post that day wrote a story about the march and never mentioned Martin Luther King. Wow. Because they, he was too late. You too know, late. it was too late in the day, and right. they just didn't notice. And, and actually, when you're in a a group like that where there were so many thousands of people, it's hard to sort it out. But mm -hmm. it was obvious that it was important. And the lead on my story said that it was possibly the most important civil rights event up until that day. Mm -hmm.